We miss your singing as well as your siblings. So when all three of them get up here, it's a powerful, powerful message, isn't it? Happy Sabbath, everyone. For for a prayer, for a dedication prayer, that typically is reserved before the sermon, I want to pray for a group of our volunteers that will be working hard throughout the entire next week. Now, you're probably guessing by, by seeing the, the beautiful stage that is intended to attract our attention, but also to involve us, that next week we will have a Vacation Bible School. And Vacation Bible School is not just time when... Uh, our kids get to have fun in the middle of summer and to get out of the house. But it, it is an opportunity for our church and our children to be impacted in a thorough and continuous way throughout the time when nothing else is impacting them intentionally or positively. Summertime is not the time when children are studying. Summertime is not the time when you know, nothing shall happen. And this opportunity for, for us to impact our, our family, but also impact the community. Every time we have a vacation Bible school, we have children coming to church that we've never met before, or children come that are only come during vacation Bible school because it is, it is a wonderful, engaging environment. So right now I'd like to ask everyone who is going to volunteer to stand up, as well as families who are going to send their children also be stand up and the children to stand up. And we want to have a special prayer for our volunteers, for our families. And what you see right now are the people who are participating, but also brothers and sisters, this is a call for you. What can you do to help? Are there, is there a neighbor that you can invite? Is there, uh, are there children of your co-workers that you can give the invitation to? Because trust me, the program here is very thorough, very fun, and very, and very blessed. And uh, uh, as I said before, we have people who come out of community every single year who don't come to our church any other time, no matter what kind of programs that we put. So now that you've seen the volunteer, I'd like to ask all of you to thank for me. Because even though you may not be participating, I'm urgently calling you all in and invite you to pray for Keshe Bible School because this is a tremendous opportunity for our children to have a lifelong impact in their church and also for our church. So, as, as right now, I am enrolling you as, as, as a prayer volunteer. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Will you participate with us in the ministry? Yeah. Because this is a way to impact beyond ourselves. So thank you for those of you who will be participating physically and thank you for those of you who will be remembering in the morning or at night, please pray. In your, in your bulletin, there's a little card that says when the time is. So if you can, put it on your, on your uh, phone and let your phone remind you to pray during the time of, of the vacation Bible school. Because we don't want to go by our power, our strength, our wisdom. We want the Lord to guide us, both in what we say and how we say it, so that our young people may know the Lord and may be drawn to Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you. We thank you for a beautiful reminder through Sister Sylvia what the goal and the message of Scripture is. It is Jesus and His salvation. And it's because of Jesus' way here. We're drawn to him, we're loved by him, and we're here to praise him, we're here to learn more about him. In a special way, Lord, I want to dedicate to you the men, the women, young men, young women, and boys and girls who will be participating in Vacation Bible School. It is an opportunity, Lord, for our church to grow stronger together and for our young people to see the same excitement that we do when we study your word, the same passion, the same relevance. It is a chance for them to grow close to each other and learn to listen and to respect to those of us who they see maybe only once a week. By the way, we want your name to be glorified in everything that is done. So we submit ourselves to you, we dedicate ourselves to you, and we ask for your holy angels to protect this physical property. Every individual has the coming in and going back, so that at the end of this week, our children may know you more, may love you more, and may live lives that are a better reflection of your will and of your truth. Lord, we dedicate ourselves to the church, and now, Lord, as we are about to open your word, we ask you to open our hearts and minds. In Jesus, and we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. I have just a few brief announcements aside from uh, from one before. First of all, our nominating committee has spent many hours and, and, and few days in trying to organize and bring to you the list of officers for the next two years. And we are ready to show you a preliminary uh, report. So at the Welcome Center, you will find two pages that are that are. Uh, fixed to the welcome set, as well as few news pages that will give you the list of proposed leaders for different departments for the next two years. Now, our list is not going to lead there are a few vague names, and the list right now only contains the leaders. Now, there's another list that I expect because with some ministries we were able to find more volunteers, with some we didn't. But 
two weeks from today, so on June the 18th, uh, we will be voting on officers that are presented, that will be presented, because the, the chairman said that we have to split the list for two weeks and then vote on the third. But for those of you who are interested, you can look at the list. For those who won't take a list home, we have made a provision for you to take uh, some of them. And the church mail says if you have any objections to the names that are presented, you are to bring those objections to me. And then I will uh, bring either your objection or you to the nominating committee so we can review uh, whether the names need to be refute, uh, reviewed or whether they need to be left as they are. And so in these two weeks, if there's any objections to the names that are proposed, we'll certainly come back together as a committee and review them. But otherwise, uh, we'll be voting on them two weeks from today. Okay? Also, I, I, I for an announcement that's unrelated. In our, our little display box, is there Perhaps you'll see right now, or you'll, you'll soon see a little poster like this. Now, it says Texas Volunteers, and not much, if any, I want to tell you a little bit about it. Earlier this year, our leadership in the Texas Conference felt that not only is the Lord calling us to impact communities where we are and the churches where we are, but that the wealth, both of physical and spiritual resources that we have, calls us to be engaged in the work of the gospel, not just here, but everywhere, particularly in places of the world where the gospel is still not allowed to be freely preached or practiced. So as a result, the Texas Conference has, has decided to partner with North African and Middle Eastern Union in order to assist them in furthering the work of the gospel. Uh, so it involves in countries of North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, and even into the Middle East. And we understand that freedom there is non-existent. And in particular, to start the work, the Texas Conference has selected 10 cities, 10 cities that have a population of over a million people that have zero at its presence. And we decided to pray for them. And particularly our, you know, and, and the cities are like Makarash in Morocco, Algiers in Algeria, Giza in Egypt, that the city that central Texas area was assigned is Amdran in this area. It is a city located right across the river from uh, Khartoum, which is also uh, over a million uh, population. And both of those cities have zero at its presence. So our focus is Amdran, Syria, and we first invite you to pray. Because right now, if 15 of us decide to go as the missionaries, we probably will disappear. Because right now, there is no way or no opportunity for anybody. As a matter of fact, some of our uh, uh, current leaders are planning to take a trip to the area, travel from the seas. But when the State Department heard that they're planning to go there just to visit, they were warned there are some cities that they ought not to go to at all because tourists have been to disappear. Never mind a group of pastors. You know, who, who are going there just to visit the So that's the kind of difficulty that, that those brothers and sisters are going through. But we believe that just because people have access, the Holy Spirit does. And we see that our role to begin with is to pray for the Holy Spirit to lay the ground. The goal is eventually to send student missionaries, where you know, somebody who is willing to attend a university in one of those areas would attend the university and receive a degree, but at the same time form connections and become a living witness, even though they are not there active preaching and so forth. So it's a long-term goal, but right now the goal, and as a matter of fact, uh, we were specifically listing the area of little information because, as I said before, there is risk. You know, if, if you post on Facebook, I'm going to Durant to pay for them, you may not come back. That's how serious it is according to the uh, State Department. So, so we're not displaying, we're not, we're not discussing what it is that we're doing there, and, and particularly in the moment when we can't do anything, but we can pray. So we, uh, as, as you see this post, you pass by now, may be a reminder to you that the goal for us is to pray for a million plus population of the city of Amdoran, so the Lord may open the opportunity for the gospel to reach that city to be preached. And pray for the story. Imagine, if cities of millions have zero presence, what about smaller cities and villages where hundreds and thousands of people are also living? So it's a, it is a wonderful endeavor, and uh, it is a needed endeavor. As somebody who grew up in the, in the environment where the gospel was not supposed to be preached, I certainly understand the, the urgency and important, importance of doing it. You know, sometimes when you look at the, you know, at, at the economic, or the political, geopolitical, or you know, ecological events around us, we say, oh, Jesus is coming soon. We want to come soon. But to realize that we are ready to pack our bags and go to heaven, there are cities of millions that have not been exposed to the message at all. The Lord will come in his time, and the Lord will have mercy on those who have heard and have not heard gospel. But it doesn't mean that we ought not to take time and effort in engaging ourselves in the work of salvation while there is time. So the Lord says the harvest will be ready. Our job is to pray to the Lord of Harvest. Amen? Thank you. Thank you. What does it mean to live grace? In Matthew chapter 12, the gospel tells us a story, a time Jesus and his disciples walking in the middle of the fields. They left one city and they were going to another and were hungry. And they were fed with residents. 
And the only thing that they could do was to what? Pluck some wheat from fields, rub in their hands so chaff fall off, and, and eat seeds. Have you ever done that? You know, wheat is so sweet when it's, when it's uh, still kind of soft green. So as they were doing that, they were accompanied with a crowd because Jesus, being who he was, did not walk with his disciples. He always had people, those who liked him and those who didn't like him. And the scripture says, as, as the disciples were doing that and eating, the crowd started to condemn. They started to condemn him and the disciples, saying, you're all sinners. What are you doing is wrong. Now, were they doing something wrong? <laughs> technically, no, but technically, yes. <laughs> Let me tell you what I mean. Scripturally, certainly Jesus was not violating Sabbath in any way or form, particularly because there was a need for Sabbath for those who were doing the work of the gospel. But culturally, they were raised to believe that this action was wrong. And made it wrong in the minds of the people. I'll give you an example. Suppose you grew up in a culture where, according to the etiquette, it is wrong for men to wear a hat inside of a building. Some of you have grew up in kind of right? It's wrong. And here I walk in with the head because I grew up in a culture where it was not a way of showing respect. So even though, no, no, but there's there anything morally wrong with wearing a head in a building? No, but if you grow up with the etiquette that says that it's disrespectful to do so, you will feel disrespected. You see the trick? You see, because you grew up in, in a culture, because you were taught that the particular behavior demonstrates respect or disrespect, you react to it, with a, not because there's morality, but you will imply morality. Because if I walk in with that and you think I have no better, you will think that I'm disrespecting you on purpose. And no, 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 no. So, he, you know, while Jesus did not do anything wrong, we ought to understand that the sensitivity that you were experiencing was warranted by some measure. And Jesus did not have a problem with the sensitivity. You know what you had a problem with? It's with how it related to others who were different from them. So in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7, Jesus says these words, If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned. If you know what it means to live by grace, even when somebody does something that's contrary to your understanding, you will not condemn. See, the problem is, is while we come here and we're joyful for salvation and grace, in eternity that Jesus gives to us because of his sacrifice, we are saved by grace, but we don't live by grace. We live by lists. We live by lists of behavior. We live by lists of do's and don'ts, largely determined by our culture, being sometimes determined by our perspective of love, religion, and spirituality. My background is a very legalistic background. The way, don't confuse legalism with conservative, because... Legalism is just assigning a, a value on behavior and therefore value in a person. And I have been condemned to hell just as much by liberals as I have been conservatives because I did not fit into their molds. So they are very legalist liberals, just as they are very legalistic conservatives. And they are conservatives who are not legalistic, they are liberals, not legalists. Is that the difference? So I grew up in a very legalistic environment. All of those people were good people, silly people, committed people. They were addicted. They were addicts to legalism. You know, addicts are generally good people, unloving people. You see, the only problem is that when they need a hit, it's then when they turn into who knows what, and they'll do whatever it takes to get a hit. So people who are committed to fulfilling the life or establishing their self-worth by do's or don'ts are generally good people, except when the lit comes into question, or the self-identity requires the urgency. Everything that we are, everything that makes us saved, everything that gives future, is based on grace. Amen? Without grace, there is no reason for us to exist. Without grace, there is no reason for us to worship. Without grace, there is no reason to pray. Without grace, there is no reason to read the Bible. No, I'm not diminishing any other principle or, or, or truth or theology. What I'm saying is that every other truth without grace is not true. Because it is only in the context of what Jesus has done for us that everything else becomes reality. But is it? the problem is, we believe in grace when it comes to salvation. But everywhere else, we believe in lists of proper behavior. Let me ask you a question. Is there a sin that God would refuse to forgive? No, the scripture says that God cannot forgive the, gri the grievance of the Holy Spirit. But essentially, since the Holy Spirit, according to John, is the one who convicts you of sin arising in the judgment to come, grieving, meaning rejecting the invitation to apologize. 
Right? So aside from the unpardonable sin of rejecting the Holy Spirit's promise, is there a sin that God would not forgive or would refuse to forgive? No. There's not one single sin. There is no combination of sin. There's no quantity of sins that God would not forgive. Otherwise, some of us would not be saved no matter how much you were committed to Him. Right? But here's a question. Is there a sin that you would not forgive? Whether yourself, or your spouse, or your child, or your brother and sister. Do you what I mean when I say we are happy to be saved by grace? But when it comes to living by grace, mm, grace comes short. If we had only truly known the grace of God, if we had only truly experienced forgiveness for our general sinful nature, then we would be able to experience the grace in specific, personal, relational experiences in life. And that is why, that's why we can be in church, where we all claim to be Christians, where most of us claim to be born again, converted, baptized. Some of us are in process of making a commitment, but at the same time, we can be sitting next to a husband and a wife that we hate. We can be sitting in a pew, struggling with a personal sin, habits, addictions, Unhealthy emotions. There are shopaholics, workaholics, alcoholics, abusers of illicit drugs, abusers of prescription drugs, people who are so focused on their appearance, they abuse themselves physically, emotionally. There are people who are so focused on external that they abuse others physically, emotionally. Am I talking about a church out there or am I talking about a church here? I'm talking about us. And if you're a visitor, I apologize that you found a congregation of sinners. If you're looking for a congregation of saints, wait until Jesus comes back. Now, this is not an excuse for who we are, this is a challenge. The challenge is to, while we think grace is worthy enough to save us for eternity, we're going to see grace. Grace is powerful enough to impact our daily lives. And we're incapable of giving ourselves to others. We're incapable of providing mercy to ourselves or to others. And Jesus said, if you had only known what it means. See, we need to understand that just as we're saved by grace, we're called to a grace life, not the life of obedience. I want to give you some contrast. And by the way, I'm not saying the word obedience is a bad word. I, 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 let, let me use the life of legalism because... Obedience is good in the right context. But if you think obedience is what gets you somewhere, that, that, that's when it's wrong. So if, if I'll try to use legalism, legal, uh, legalistic life. If I switch to another, please, please don't, yeah, don't misunderstand me. What's the difference? What's the contrast between two? Legalism-based life is a life where I live to please God. Grace life is a life where I live to trust God. A legalistic life is a life where I show that I'm sorry for being a sinner. Grace-based life is a life where I show that I believe that I am forgiven. See, a good example of in, in, in difference is, is an example of a relationship between a student and a teacher. A student and teacher can have two types of relationship. One is a relationship that happens in a classroom when you learn. The other one is a relationship in a classroom where you write a test. What happens when you write a test? The teacher gives you a, a paper and the interaction thesis until you show them that you have memorized whatever you need to and you can reflect back to them what they have taught you. And then what does the teacher do? He judges you on whether they succeed or not. That's a legalistic life. If you think that there is a certain set of proficiencies that God is expecting for you to achieve before he loves you, you live a life of test. But there's a life of learning, where the teacher is still a teacher, the student is still a student, but the teacher engages with the student, and he helps him or her grow. And you're not afraid to show what you don't know, like it would be on a test, right? Because if you know something at a test, you fail. If you know something in a classroom, it's great, because now the teacher knows what to teach you and what to help you. And the closer you have that relationship, the more you can grow, the closer the, the, the more open you are, the more they can assist you. And the teachers that love the most were the teachers who were able to connect with us personally and, and, and share the subject in such a way where we were able to relate and to implement our lives. The students that teachers hate most, the students who think that they know everything. I remember seeing a seminary wanting to tell one of my friends, please shut up, I didn't pay to listen to you, I paid to listen to him. Because always somebody who tries to show how much he knows, you're not here to show me for the test. And most of the time, they fail each and every test because they spend more time thinking about what they knew instead of surrendering to their teacher and learning from what your ship provided. Legalistic life promotes fear because you always wonder, will I fail while 
Chris Lai promotes faith because you're just wondering about what else you can do to cover. The realistic life creates worry that I get it right. Well, grace based life creates harm. It builds confidence in one that you surrender to. Legalistic life is masked life. You're always careful not to show to others who you truly are. You're always careful to try to pretend that you know more, that you believe more, that you're strong than you are. Well, grace life is transparent. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to make up passion. You don't have to fake belief. Legalistic life is built on critical theory. Well, Grace life is a compassionate spirit. Because I know what God has done for me, and I am willing and able to wish the same for others. Legalistic life is built on a sense of guilt, because you're never able to measure up to the perfect standard. While the grace life is built on a sense of freedom, because the standard is not applied to me, it's applied to Jesus, and His righteousness is what covers me. Obedience based life creates pride. Look at how much I've accomplished. While grace based life is about humility. Look what God has accomplished in me. The more I surrender, the more He can do. That's why in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4, Solomon says, This is the beginning. God hates the prideful, but he favors those who are humble. Legalistic life is exclusive. Because you see, not only bad people, but even different people threaten my list. Their list is different. They shouldn't be here. While grace is life, 